I bled to death on the operating table. And so my heart did stop. And so I was technically dead for two and a half minutes. But in those first few moments, I guess, before my heart stopped, I was just looking at my body and there was no pain. There was just joy. And I knew this was like the spirit going on. It was so much more than a dream because my consciousness outside of body felt more intelligent, more heightened than my own consciousness. And then I saw these light beings that were working through the doctors and they were like an added reality to this reality. So I knew I was seeing this reality and then they humbled me in a sense. These light beings were just massive and they had this intelligence and this light that immediately calmed me down. And I also knew that they were healers. I knew that they were working through the surgeons, through their hands and helping my spine and ensuring that I would walk, that I would run. I had this knowledge that they would be open to it, but I was fascinated that these light beings were there. And then that's when the monitor stopped. And that's when I knew that sound of the heart stopping. I knew I had died. And that's when I left the hospital room. But then I quickly just transitioned out of the hospital into the night sky and felt this oneness really with everyone I'd ever known, anyone I'd ever passed. And I just felt this like at a core level what the soul feels as it transitions into death. And then the tunnel that I went through was very quick. And suddenly I was in this night sky full of stars. And I began to feel this intelligence coming toward me, sort of like the intelligence I felt from the light beings or angels, but this intelligence felt like divinity or God or something just powerful. And in that moment, I just waited to see what would happen. And I was shown moments of my life. And this is the life review. And what I saw was moments in nature were good. These moments when I was playing as a kid and enjoying nature that this pleased the divine intelligence. I also heard direct messages like remind them to go to nature. There was this greater release the longer I was in that place. And there was a timelessness to it, which is hard to explain, but there's like waves of intelligence, waves of energy, vibration. It's kind of like a download, but it's like a massive wave of energy hits you. And then you just know certain things. Welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. This show is for entrepreneurs. They have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Ng. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary, challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to this week's Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. I want to use the word exciting about today's podcast, but I have this warmly feeling about this special lady that's going to be our guest. Her name is Trisha Barker. Why do I say this? I don't know. That's just seeing some of her videos and seeing her over Zoom. And that's this warmness about her. There's this vulnerability, there's this rawness about her, but there's this also this aspect of her. She's also tapped into this spiritual world. So that's my take on why I feel so special about today's podcast. A bit of context and background, Trisha has gone through a physical world type of grooming and gone through depression and different issues until one day she had a knee death experiences and that set her into a whole new path. But even after the NDE is not exactly like smooth selling as well, there's a lot of integration and other external events that drove her to further exploring this spiritual world and how to integrate a lot of the things that she's been gifted to learn. I've titled this podcast, What Dying Taught Me About Healing, Survival and Transformation as per what her website talks about. So usually a lot of us, uh, one of the biggest fear that we have is about dying. 
but from a lot of the things that I've studied about like NDE is about like dying usually is a beautiful experiences. The more that we can take some of these lessons that we could learn from the other side and bring it back to integrate about our earthly life, I think the more wisdom, the, the more wiser we'll live our daily life. So Trisha, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. And thanks for that sweet introduction. I do feel driven to tell people about the near-death experience to ease their fear of dying, because really any connection to that spiritual realm helps ease it. But a near-death experience is kind of a profound way to ease the fear. Yeah. So for the people that don't know your story, could you share a bit like before the NDE and the events that led up to it? And just so that we can get a context of what was life before and how did the whole NDE happen? Yeah. So I was agnostic from about seventh grade until my near-death experience, which happened my senior year of college at the University of Texas. And as an agnostic, I was terrified of death. I was very concerned with the material body, with success, with doing well in college. You know, I was also struggling emotionally because of my upbringing and dealing with depression and kind of numbing myself from a lot of drinking and drugs. But what was most important to me was success. I thought that was what was going to heal all those wounds of childhood, poverty, abuse, you know, all those things. And I would have these moments where I was just terrified at the thought of death. I was like, oh, someday this body will die. And I remember just panicking those months before my near-death experience. And it was almost like my soul had some kind of premonition. Something was about to happen. And a few weeks before graduation, on the way to run the Austin 10K, I had a major head-on collision and broke my back in three places. My spine was compromised. I waited many, many hours for a spinal surgeon to work on me. After 17 hours of waiting, lots of internal injuries, broken foot, and I'd completely lost feeling in my left leg. I was terrified, thinking I may not walk, thinking this was, you know, as a a very athletic person, this was a horrific concept to wrap my head around. There was also this part of me that had to give up control. For the first part of my life, I was like, okay, my life is in the hands of these neurosurgeons. My life is now in balance and it's all dependent on these people. Well, the first thing that happened is I don't know how long I had been out during the surgery, but I know that they had opened up my back. And so I have a very long incision, you know, almost from the top of my back to the very end of the spine. And then a lot of uh, scars on my hip because they took bone from my hip and placed this into the back. So I lifted up out of my body. And technically this was just an out of body experience at this point. But Gary, I was so excited. Like the first thing that I felt was, (gasps) oh my God, the spirit goes on. You know, this soul, this spirit, it felt essential and it felt so incredibly real. And I didn't really think I needed the full near-death experience because that first moment was enough for me to go, here I am, I'm watching my surgeons, I'm looking at my body. This is proof that indeed, you know, we survived death. And I was so relieved. Then I looked up and I was looking at the surgeons and I thought, Can I just pause you for a minute or a second? Most of us, when we have operation, we have gas or or medication that knocks us out, right? So were you knocked out by the medications? Yes, I was. So they had given me plenty of anesthesia. And what happened is, I'll just jump forward. Um, I bled to death on the operating table. And so my heart did stop. And so I was technically dead for two and a half minutes later, they looked at hospital records and that was the cause of death. But in those first few moments, I guess, before my heart stopped, I was just looking at my body and, you know, there was no pain. There was just joy. And I knew this was like the spirit going on. Was there a moment that, I guess when we have operation or when we get anesthetic and we get knocked out, like... Well, for me, I don't remember what happened until the operation is over or all this stuff like my veins and I poked into my arms and stuff. Was there a point that, oh, how come I'm aware of what's going on? Or is it like a dream that suddenly you just, it was so, it was so much more than a dream because my consciousness outside of body felt 
more intelligent, more heightened than my own consciousness. And then I saw these light beings that were working through the doctors and they were like an added reality to this reality. So I knew I was seeing this reality and then they humbled me in a sense. These light beings were just massive and they had this intelligence and this light that immediately calmed me down. And I also knew that they were healers. I knew that they were working through the surgeons, through their hands and helping my spine and helping and ensuring that I would walk, that I would run. And they even said, watch this as they work through the doctors. And I remember even thinking, I'm going to ask the neurosurgeons later if they're aware of light beings working through them. And I was like, they probably will not appreciate this. <laughs> you know, like I had this knowledge that they would be open to it, but I was fascinated that these light beings were there. And then that's when the monitor stopped. And that's when I knew you know, that sound of, you know, the heart stopping, I knew I had died. And that's when I left the hospital room and researchers love my story because I have a verifiable event that happened. So when consciousness survives the form, like to me, this wasn't important, but I saw my stepdad get a candy bar at a vending machine. And he kind of looked down on people who ate candy and, and, you know, he was like this health nut. And so I kind of giggled thinking, oh, you know, there he is getting a candy bar. I hope he's good to my mom. Later, after the near-death experience, when I talked about it, I found out that my mom and dad were both praying at that moment because they were pretty certain I died. So when he walked back into that room with the candy bar and made a joke, they were both on their knees. And to me, that touches me more because I think there's a psychic bond between parents and children. And they just know sometimes family members or people who are close to one another know when someone's in danger or, you know, when their life is in balance. So that was, you know, this moment in the hospital corridor. But then I quickly just transitioned out of the hospital into the night sky and felt this oneness really with everyone I'd ever known, anyone I'd ever passed. And I just felt this like at a core level, what the soul feels as it transitions into death is just, I love you and have a good life and enjoy it. And, you know, even people who I didn't care for, I still wanted them to have a good life and to be better and to enjoy this life that, you know, at our core, we really are love. And that's what I felt, you know, at that soul level. And then a lot of near-death experiences have this tunnel and the tunnel that I went through was very quick. And suddenly I was in this night sky full of stars and I began to feel this intelligence coming toward me, sort of like the intelligence I felt from the light beings or angels, but this intelligence felt like divinity or God or something just powerful. And in that moment, I just waited, you know, to see what would happen. And I was shown moments of my life and this is the life review. And what I saw was moments in nature were good. These moments when I was playing as a kid and enjoying nature that this pleased uh, the divine intelligence. And what didn't please the divine intelligence about my life was judgment. So I sometimes judge people based on their academics or their interest or their music or their clothes or, you know, just their social standing in life. And the light was like, you're not looking at the heart. You're not looking at who people are. And some people that I thought were quote, cool, really didn't care about me at all. <laughs> and, and some people who I really just brushed aside were very caring, spiritual, beautiful people inside. And when I saw how beautiful they were, inside, I just wanted to cry. I wanted to come back and do better. And I knew that who we are inside matters so much more than our interest and, and, you know, our social standing and all of that, that God looks at the heart literally. And so that was my big lesson at that time was to look at the hearts of people. I also heard direct messages, like remind them to go to nature. Love is all that we take when we go and there was this greater release the longer I was in that place. And there was a timelessness as well to it, which is hard to explain, but you kind of learn in waves. You know, there's like waves of intelligence, waves of energy, vibration. People talk about downloads now. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a download, but it's like a 
massive wave of energy hits you and then you just know certain things. So I transferred basically from being a spirit form that was like mostly light and kind of resembled who I was at 21. When I heard the words, be like a little child, I simply became like a little child. So I morphed my spirit into this child and I entered this beautiful landscape, which I think some people would call heaven. To me, it felt like a holding space. I felt like it was a place to rest and consider what happens next. And then I saw my grandfather and he was the only person who was dead at that time. And he always represented unconditional love to me. He was my dad's father and I was his only grandchild. And we had kind of a close bond. He had died when I was 10. And when I saw him, he looked so young. So I looked like a kid and he looked so young. I barely recognized him except for his jaw and you know his eyes, which shone with light. And There was just a lot of love exchanged in that moment. But at some point he asked, do you want to continue on? And I knew that continue on meant go closer to God. Did you have a question? No, well, I just find it incredible as I'm listening to you, how detailed your recollection is. And from a lot of people that go for NDE, like listening to those stories and reading a whole book about their experiences, I find it incredible because like with dreams, when we wake up, like if we do remember, it's like very sketchy. And if anything, and within after an hour, is most of the details are gone. But yet, like you can tell the whole story in such all the minute details. Even though I've I've heard other people and I've heard your story, but every time listening to it, it's just like, wow, this is amazing. Well, I'm glad you brought up that point because actually, I feared. You know, when I woke up from the experience in the hospital and I was given morphine and all these drugs, I was actually afraid that I might forget it. And it was so profound and so beautiful that I started jotting down, you know, visuals of the angels and visuals of what I saw because I knew it wasn't a dream, but I was afraid that the medication might dull the memory or erase it. But really the opposite has happened. It's almost like I don't know. It sounds like a weird comparison, but it's almost like an alien abduction or, you know, it's so different from this life that, you know, the other details of my life, like before that, you know, what apartment I lived in, you know, just other memories aren't as clear, but that near-death experience kind of stays the same, I guess, because it's so unusual and unlike anything, you know, here in this realm. (laughs) And, And I think too, it it speaks to the soul and, you know, you're seeing with different eyes, you're remembering with a different form of intelligence. And, and it really is, you know, when people say that 20 year integration, it is a 20 year (laughs) integration, you know, like for many people, I think in this day and age, there's a lot more support and there's a lot more um, help, I think, for those who've had awakenings or near death experiences, but certainly I had to adjust to a lot of these moments, but yeah, I'll never forget on an emotional level as well, you know, what it felt like to fly and I'll just keep telling the rest of the experience if you want me to. As my soul flew toward that light of God, this is really the part that almost makes me want to cry because there's no feeling like it here on earth. And I think that's the, the thing that people listen to near-death experiencers and we sound suicidal or like, we're just like ready to die, but it's not that it's just, we wish that we could be that pure and love that deeply and that openly and that everyone could, because we'd heal the world if we could, you know, because that love took away every pain within me. So every emotional wound from childhood, every moment of abuse, every moment of my self-esteem being crushed, suddenly it was helped, you know, like my self-esteem grew in the presence of that love and all those wounds just were darkness that didn't even matter in the presence of that love. And I never wanted to leave as I got closer and closer to that love of God. I just thought, Ooh, you know, why would I return there and feel pain and feel insecurity and feel fear? Like, this is great. I don't want to leave this place. And as soon as I thought that this barrier just kind of came down and I couldn't go any farther, 
And then this booming voice and, you know, like people always ask, what does the voice of God sound like? Well, just like telepathy sound is different. It's not really the same way we hear because we don't have ears that, you know, like have the same, you know, physical makeup. Our eyes don't have the same makeup, but it was a vibration that was incredibly strong. And it just, I heard this vibration say, look down. And I looked down to this place on earth that was a river and there were many souls that were walking and some of them were covered in light and it seemed like they were connected to the divinity. Others had this shadow around them. And to me, I just knew kind of like a course in miracles or anything like, oh, they've just got fear around them. So, you know, they just need to be reminded that all that love and all that power is right there for them if only they can remember and it doesn't matter what the fear is whether it's depression whether it's anger whether whatever it is i just saw fear seems so simple but i also got this message you're going to be a teacher and then i was upset (laughs) at that point (laughs) because i was like "Oh, oh if i'm going back i remember who i was and i didn't want to have a career where I struggled financially, you know, that was something I did not want to experience. And I was like, no, God, that's a traditional career for women. You know, no, that's not enough money, not doing that. And I knew it wasn't spiritual teacher. I knew it was actually teacher, you know, like in public schools and colleges. And I was just refusing my mission. And God kind of laughed, like I literally felt laughter. And then it was almost like, my soul became this softball or baseball. It was crumpled up and just thrown back into my body. And so I felt this wind, this enormous darkness pushing me back into my form. And then like you were describing, you know, you wake up and there's stuff in your veins and they're giving you ice chips and asking you your name. But even from that first moment, when they asked me my name, I knew I was different because I could not say my name. I said, I remember her name. Uh, her name is Trisha. And they said, no, you have to say my name is. And I remember this profound sadness actually going, I was just out there connected to all this beauty and all this light and this great cosmos. And now I have to be this one body, this broken body, you know, that's in a lot of pain. And I have to be this person who has suffered. And now I have to be me again. And I wasn't particularly happy to be me, but I was happy to think about that light. And I was very happy to think about the experience. And it it did get me through those nine days in the hospital and got me through all the healing, actually. Yeah. So when I hear about people sharing the NDE, because it is a need depth and a lot of them are actually severe accidents even though they feel a renewed person and they feel so much more love and joy and a lot of them may have gone through depression and other issues and a lot of them seems like those issues largely has been cleansed or detoxed or purged out of them but yet on the road to recovery they still have the physical pain and other like physical reality stuff like bills to pay and other stuff that they have to go through so on one side, you got all this joy and love and abundance. On the other side, it's like the physical stuff that I have to deal with. So how do you navigate through that journey? Was it smooth sailing for you? Was it challenging? You know, most people would look at it and call it challenging, but it felt joyful. I felt like a kid again. You know, I felt like I'm learning to walk. I felt like I had a restart in life. And so the pain when I left the hospital was enormous. And I couldn't take painkillers for whatever reason. I vomited them up. And now we know about the opioid addiction. And, you know, like a lot of people after major accidents do get addicted to those pills, but I had to suffer. So I would lay there in bed and it felt like a hot poker was in my back because I have these metal rods running down my spine and I didn't get much sleep. And so I thought, okay. I need to heal. I need to do something. Let me call on these angels that I saw during surgery. And I would feel their blue lights beginning to work on my back. And then I was like, well, I did it during the near death experience. Let's see if I can get out of body. And so I just would put on kind of meditation music or yoga music or something that was just peaceful. And if I couldn't sleep, I'd just go fly around outside of my body. And I'd spend so much time and out of body experiences that by morning, I was like, 
wait, am I dead? Am I alive? What's going on here? <laughs> you know, I yeah. kind of forget, <laughs> but it would give my body time to heal. So those first couple of weeks, I couldn't stand to be in my body. And then I started learning to walk and, and after a week or two, I was walking to the mailbox and then I was walking down the street and I was really conscious of everything, you know, whether it was the bird in the tree or the neighbor that I talked to. And for the first time, I felt connected to that bird and that neighbor and people around me. I didn't feel so closed off the way I had felt before. And I talked with different older people who were retired on their patios who had had cancer. And I told them my story, <laughs> you know, that was in this big bulky body cast with this walking stick. And I'm sure I looked funny to them, but they also got to know my story. And so there was this community outside of my mom and stepdad's house of retired people. And by the time I made it to the end of the street, they stood up and they clapped for me. <laughs> you know, They just were happy to see my progress. So there was a lot of out-of-body experiences at first. There was a lot of psychic flashes, a lot of sensitivity. The after effects of a near-death experience were pretty profound and immediate for me. Wow. I resonate with different parts of your stories like through my own journey that I remember maybe a year ago when I first started like lucid dreaming and practicing on it. And when I wake up, it's like, whoa, like that was a journey. Like, and every night I go to sleep, I know I'm going somewhere, even though the next day I couldn't remember much detail. By the time I woke up, it's like, I did a lot. Like I get that sensation <laughs> and that prompted me to study a lot about dream world and why do we dream and where do we go? And for the listeners, I guess like the conclusion from studying a lot of the ancient wisdom is that we all dream. It's just that over time, especially when we grow up, we lose the ability to remember like what the dream is like. So to hear that from you and the other thing you shared about like being more conscious and present to the birds and different things. Um, again, before when I was in this spiritual journey, I followed um, one of my mentor, like Tony Robbins to India. And again, I don't meditate. I'm not any of that. But after one of the meditative process, it says like, just be present with the moment and don't talk to anyone. Uh, I remember like we're in these uh, peaceful surroundings with like the rivers and different places and like, what are we supposed to do? Like be present? Okay, well, I see like a leaf on the tree. I didn't notice that before. Maybe that's it. And then I see the smile on people's face. Is that it? And it's not something that, I guess if you try, like, because you know, like you said, like success was really important to you. And a lot of the entrepreneurs about hustle, success, and efforts. This is one of those things. It's not like, let me try harder to give that present, to get a consciousness, to enjoy the leave, enjoy the leave, and they can just get there. But for the people that's listening, that may feel like, hey, I wish I can get to her state, but I'm not like rest assured, like I wasn't at that state. But eventually, you may be like a fraction of a second that. Hey, that looks enjoyable, but you may think that it's through your effort that got you there. I believe it's the divine leading to you to this journey of awakening. And eventually you're going to see and feel more of it. And obviously if you're being called to do more meditation, then do it. But if you're not being called to maybe like even washing the dishes, that's a form of meditation for you that can get you deeper. So Trisha, you talked about this um, 20 years like integration period. I've never heard that before. Can you share what does that entail? Yeah, well, I never let go of God's last words to me, which were go be a teacher. So I was like, okay, then I'm going to do this. And so I went back to college and got my teaching certification. And I remember thinking, okay, what's the point? And my first group of students were these juniors in high school. And just to pause here for a second, was there much of a battle internally? Because how old were you at the time? I was 21. So I was 22 so by the time I went back to college. So 23 by the time I was teaching. So for 20, 21, 22 years of your life, you've been conditioned to think that success and not a teacher. But on the other hand, it's like, a higher source is like a higher experience, like telling you and conveying to you that teaching. So was it like, oh, you're weighing up between the two? Or was it so clear that your internal guidance system to say that I need to pursue this path, even though it may not well, make logical sense? 
I felt like I was either going to die or have that near death experience. And so I felt like I'd been given the gift of life. And if that's what I was commanded to do, then there was no turning back on it. And I did intellectually and spiritually try to connect with it and find out what's the healing, what's the purpose. And since I had experienced a couple of forms of child abuse, I thought probably a lot of kids have too. So as I began to heal myself, what can I teach them, you know, through literature, you know, or at least through a lecture to help them speed that process? Or what can I say to these kids to help them awaken to spirituality without, quote, teaching religion, but just awaken to their light, you know, and their light can be excitement about the future, passion, um, you know, just their soul's purpose somehow. What is that? And so when I walked into the classroom, I just thought, Oh, okay. Just, you know, like, uh, I'll just tell the story, you know, I'll tell them why I'm here. And so to every class, I, I told them my near death experience story and why I'm teaching. And this one kid in the front row in my very first class, his mouth was just wide open and he stayed after everyone left. And he said, I had one of those. And he said, I'm, I'm 19, even though I'm a junior, I was in the hospital for a year. I had a traumatic brain injury. And I was in and out of body a lot. And, you know, he's like, I haven't told anyone. I can't even tell my parents. I'm just so different. And I said, okay, then I'm your appointment. You know, I'm meant to be here perhaps just because of you. So every day we had a journal and he would write about his experience and I'd write back to him. And, you know, we'd help each other just kind of integrate, you know, this 19 year old and me 23 as his teacher. And then then the school year was just magical. I mean, I just saw students get excited about becoming a psychiatrist or get excited about, uh, you know, maybe they had a drug addiction and they wanted to be a drug and alcohol um, counselor or just I saw all these changes in students and this growth. And I thought, oh, I'm here for their growth and development. And I'm really I'm here for their paths and maybe not all of them. But, you know, like I felt as if I had some kind of contract with even that first group of students that I was meant to see them. And I felt that way for, you know, my entire teaching career. I felt that there was always someone who was meant to cross my path and that this was just almost orchestrated ahead of time. And I have to say, too, that maybe you know God knew me better than I knew myself, because in that act of helping other people, I felt freer. I didn't feel depressed. You know, the minute I came home and if I started thinking about, yeah, finances and how I had to file bankruptcy after that hospital stay and how, you know, I just barely covered rent in a small duplex or, you know, I couldn't do the type of traveling that I wanted. You know, like there were a lot of things that made me feel down about the world. And then, of course, people judged me, too. You know, like some people didn't want to date a teacher. Some people thought that was, you know, not a very lucrative career. And so there were these moments where I thought, oh, but that's how I used to be. I used to be judgmental on that level. They're missing out of my heart, just like other people. I missed out on their hearts when I came from that mindset. And so it was this, it was bittersweet, you know, at times, but I never felt depressed the minute my fit feet like hit a school district or hit the classroom, no matter how challenging life was. And, and later, you know, there were physical challenges that I navigated and worked out, you know, after a major accident, there's always some pain. But in general, I felt happy teaching. I felt like, okay, when you do something that you do well, that's when you turn on your light. So I thought of those surgeons that were assisted by the angels. And I thought maybe they really loved their jobs as neurosurgeons. Maybe they were good at it. And that's why they were assisted from the other side. And I was like, I'm good at teaching these students and joking around with them and teaching them literature and opening up their minds. Perhaps the angels are working through me and it isn't just quote me. It's this divine intelligence, this higher intelligence that is working through me. And I, I felt it at times. Nice. So uh, what you said without teaching them spirituality, you share a star with, you, with the kids. How do you teach the kids about some of the lessons that you've learned or how do you embed your lessons? 
Well, luckily I didn't teach math. <laughs> you know, I teach literature. So poetry and, you know, like short stories often have themes that can be tied to, you know, what is this person's heart like? Or what happens when we judge people? Or, you know, are these people at odds with nature? Or are they in balance with nature? There's a lot of things that are similar to those topics from the near-death experience that run through literature. And and a lot of poets are quite spiritual. You know, when I teach Walt Whitman, I mean, it's really easy to bring in the other side and, and Rilke and some of those poets. So I think my subject matter allowed me to talk about characters and people's choices and what is the divine choice you know what does environment do to us and what how do we rise above our environment there's a lot of teaching on a soul level can be done through literature wow that's cool so prior to you and have you heard about other people sharing about the nde prior to that do you know that such a thing that exists I did actually. And so that's why I was so confident when I woke up, I was like, oh, I had one of those experiences. Oh my gosh. You know, I'd heard about it from a friend who she had a friend in high school and he was kind of a wild kid and he did a lot of drugs, partied a lot. And when he woke up in the hospital, she was like, he doesn't hang out with any of us anymore. He has this light about him. And he said, he went to the other side he just has this different mission, this different life view now. And she said he seemed older, but also younger. And there was, there was just a lot that she said. He just seemed so different and full of light. Like you could literally see the light around him when he woke up. And so her account of her friend stayed with me. And then I would read about it in a psychology class too. I think maybe Raymond Moody was mentioned. And so I knew about the concept so as soon as I woke up, I was telling people, oh, yeah, I had one of those experiences. I had a near-death experience. And people in my family were very religious. And that's kind of why I became agnostic. And honestly, they were pretty judgy. I guess that's where I got that judgment from. Because, you know, I overheard things like my mom saying, oh, who is she to talk about God? You know, and just, you know, just these kind of cutting remarks. And I was like, oh, but you're wrong and I'm wrong. And no, the thing that's right is love. You know, like I was wrong being agnostic and she was wrong being so judgmental, but yet, you know, Christian, I was like, really love is the truth. That's the truth. And, you know, I knew that it was hard to communicate. Yeah. You had your student that you started communicating with, but do you have others that could guide you through this journey at that time? You know, there wasn't a lot of guidance, but it's funny that you mentioned Tony Robbins. Um, I read a lot of his books. I read a lot of Varied Williamson, you know, just so many different spiritual teachers. Uh, Wayne Dyer, you know, I just delved into spirituality and that was not my thing you know, before the, the near-death experience, but I, I read a lot out there about lucid dreaming, about, you know, just about people's spiritual paths. And you know, honestly, when I read Raymond Moody after the near-death experience, I've interviewed him now, but I remember thinking, oh, he's the one person who would understand me. I wish I could pick up the phone and call him, you know, and I probably should have, you know, I might've uh, had support earlier, but I felt like they were too quote famous or too unreachable. So there was this uh, humility I think I had of, Oh, who am I, you know, and I, I kind of kept it under wraps and just told my students for a long time until I joined an IANS group and then talked with the local woman and, she started connecting me with people from the bio channel, National Geographic. And, you know, then the story started getting out there and I was like, oh, okay, well, this is different now. <laughs> yeah, nice. Before I went through my awakening journey, I didn't know that's such a thing, but obviously you knew that there's such a thing, but I would assume back then, like with um, social media and different things are not as connected as now. It's like, where are my tribe? <laughs> Who are these other people? <laughs> Um, but I now you're actually um, building your own tribe. I saw that you've organized different conferences, NDE conferences, and collaborated with other people that have gone through similar journeys to share the experience. So kudos to you. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. About six years ago, I got another message from that vibration, that same voice I heard on the other side. 
came down and said, your mission's complete. And I remember kind of going, oh, do I die now? <laughs> you know, like, you know, what happens now? Do I get to retire and go to Costa Rica and just sit on a hammock? You know, like, what do you mean my mission's complete? And I'm still teaching because I'm honestly not quite sure what I'm meant to do beyond that. When you spend that much time in education, it's hard to leave because there's a lot of security in it. But I started a YouTube channel. I wrote the book and then really just started connecting with people. And people asked me, people who had lost loved ones, they said, well, can you contact my son? And I just began doing that for free in the beginning uh, just to see if I could, you know, if I was, quote, a medium and love that. And then started learning healing modalities and energy work and then started a spiritual community, then started interviewing other experiencers. And I don't really know where it's going. I just know that spiritual community is important. And like you said, you know, I don't really have a tribe in the city where I live. I'm trying, you know, to, to find one and create one, but I know amazing people all over the world in Australia and England and Canada you know, in in Spain, all everywhere and all over the U.S. as well. And so the beauty of writing a book and speaking publicly is exactly what you say. People who resonate with me find me and we support one another. And so I'm really thinking about how do we carry this forward as perhaps near-death experiencers? Do we get together, share our healing with people at conferences where we really, I mean, IAMS does this, but I just spoke there and I was talking about how maybe at the end we could all send healing energy to anyone who needs it, anyone who is in pain, you know, that as a collective, we could just combine our energy. Yeah, so there may be someone that knows someone that either have started or going to start a spiritual community in your city. So which city are you in? I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Fort Worth in particular. I I teach at the Trinity River campus. So that very river that I saw in the near-death experience, I saw from many classrooms. And so it was kind of a shocker. (laughs) Wow. So I guess from organizing the Need Death Experiences Summit um, and also doing the podcast as well and interviewing other people that's gone through similar journeys, what have you learned from, I guess, collating many people's journey together? You know, what I learned from the very first summit I did is that when I heard another near-death experiencer's experience, I would sometimes go into meditation afterwards and connect with the energy of the experience. And so I tell people, even if they've heard my story before, or they've heard one, like to later just meditate on what that feels like to be in the presence of that much love, you know, that it's a beautiful place to go. And many meditations do focus on that unconditional love. But the more you go there, I think the more you condition your soul to understand that there's nothing to fear that it's really just that beautiful so sometimes other experiencers have slightly different experiences and I've been able to tap into those in meditation and see kind of like on an experiential level what they experienced and that's been beautiful and I've also found that you know we're working a lot of times alone in different places and so we do need each other's support and there are you know, that need for a tribe is important because we need to be understood. And I think when I connect with someone who just had a near-death experience a couple of years ago, I think I have advice to offer sometimes about how to protect yourself, how to integrate more quickly. And so these forums, these conferences, you know, and even my community, it's just helpful. You know, it, it just helps other people on their journey. Mm. So when I was studying um, Dolores Cannon's work where she takes people through hypnosis, many of her clients are people that are suffering certain health conditions and through her work is helping her unearth why are they feeling those conditions and whether it could be healed as well. Um, What I find interesting is usually a lot of the issues are are dealt with like past lives and whether it's on this planet or other planet that hasn't been fully resolved. So that's why they're experiencing the symptoms now. I guess um, I wanted to ask you, what is the reason for people that, I guess, as part of the journey, go through knee-death experiences? Um, because I guess there they are benefits, but why using that modality as, as a particular experience that they, I wouldn't want to say have to, or most of they get to experience? Yeah, 
I am a little bit familiar with her work and I know a lot of people who have been instantly healed after regression. I do theta healing and part of theta healing is deleting through the light and through creator certain soul memories that are causing problems in this life. You know, that's part of it as well as the DNA as well, whether, you know, it's core beliefs. So I know I've made big shifts after regression. I think the soul has, it just holds on to trauma, just like the body holds on to trauma. And so it's hard to let go of because it's a shock. You know, it's, there are just moments that are shocking And part of healing is reminding the soul, the body, all of the self that it's okay to relax. It's okay to let those things go and to create anew and to create from a place of love and to create and to keep bringing in love here, no matter what we go through. So there's a lot, I'm, I'm a big proponent of not shaming people around manifestation because you know, I've taught low income students. I've taught uh, people who are really suffering and barely surviving at times. And it would be horrible to turn to someone who, you know, is going through something most of us can't wrap our brains around. You know, I've had students whose entire families have been shot in a drive-by shooting. You know, I've had students who have just suffered enormous things and they're in deep grief. And when you meet someone at that place, it's really important just to help them rebuild on on a very realistic, you know, human way. Um, and that humanity is important, that, that being there, you know, cooking food for someone, getting a support group for someone, being of service, like these things are vital. So how do you let go of soul trauma? How do you let go of actual trauma? It's often through, believe it or not, spiritual community or community. You know, I've found that many of my students have let go of great trauma, you know, suicide attempts or sexual assault experiences. They begin to let go of them by writing about them, getting support from a creative writing group. And, you know, both writing can be integrating, sharing with others can be another form of integration, and then also just releasing it through the group and through the group's compassion. So I think community can be incredibly healing. And and ancient groups of people understood this, I think, better than we do. And I think even our soul remembers it and we just long for that community. So that's uh, part of it. I guess why chooses the experience of a near-death experiences and through what you just shared, correct me if I'm kind of off track, but I'm digesting that. It is one of those unique vehicles that you could demonstrate what a miracle is. And what bigger miracle, even more than healing, is that to know that you already died and then to come back. And so on one sense that you've spiritually or your conscious self, part of your conscious self is already like, yeah, I know that you started to remember that's greater to just a physical body. And you get to know the source, God, the creator, and all these team of angels that can help you so on one part yeah you get all that but on the second part you also get the miracles of the physical body is actually being healed and saved and you can observe all these miracles you can you saw a verifiable events for your your dad like by a candy bar it's like wow like it's so unique can they just do it in a dream well you can see oh i connected with god or whatever but you don't have that miracle element and you don't have that integration of what you just said about going through the lessons of going the pain of recovery or some of the challenges of recovery. So it's actually it's such a beautiful like hero's journey that is so unique. You know, I, I almost feel sorry for people who have accidents that horrible and they don't have it coupled with a near-death experience because a near-death experience or at least connection to those light beings does show you how to use the light beings for healing, how to have an out-of-body experience. And I think a lot of people just suffer and they're upset and they can't wait to get back to normal. And certainly I couldn't wait to get back to normal and walk and, and all of that. But I also just felt supported in those early years so deeply, you know, by the other side. And I think maybe that's part of the message for humanity too, is open up to how much we're each supported. You know, we have a team of ancestors, angels. Uh, we have 
divinity that we can give our problems to and open to that light. There's so much support available. And so don't suffer alone, you know, connect to spirits and don't suffer alone, connect to other people. Mm. So in tying back to the title, we've themed the podcast and we've talked about healing, we've talked about survival, cover a bit about transformation. And I think I want to separate this into two streams. Like one is if they're listeners that has gone through NDEs or have know someone that's going through NDEs, what are some of the tips or advice that you can share with them to guide them through this transformation um, journey? And for the people that haven't gone through an NDE, what are some of the lessons that, that you can translate that will help guide them through their um, transformation as well? Yeah, so the transformation is really just letting go of the past and becoming something different. And, you know, not that we don't backslide, you know, and have moments of fear, you know, it's not this like uphill journey, you know, it's a progression, you know, there's moments where, you know, even near death experiencers feel fear or feel, you know, like even people who've awakened, you know, just get frustrated with life and people and bills. And so don't be too hard on yourself. Just know that you are evolving and it's a beautiful journey, whether you've had a near death experience or not, if you're opening to more love from the other side, if you're working on your healing, then you're evolving. To near-death experiencers, I'd say reach out to IANS, you know, watch podcasts that uplift you, find people who you can connect with and talk with. You're welcome to, you know, the first month that my spiritual community is free, you're welcome to join a couple of those and uh, meet people. And, you know, there's plenty of Facebook groups to chat and get to know other experiencers. And IANS has ISGO, you know, online versions, but find people who are willing to mentor you, you know, who are willing to give you some advice here and there and don't, um, you know, just don't be afraid to connect and don't be afraid to try out your spiritual gifts. Because I think after an awakening or a near death experience, you can learn pretty easily, (laughs) you know, like it's just your learning is amplified. Uh, your openness is amplified. And then to those who are just listening and maybe a little bit curious or a little bit fascinated in near-death experiences, it's really simple. You're either living in a cloud of fear or you're living as much as you can from a place of love. And that doesn't mean that you're stepped on by other people and you don't protect the self. I mean, there's self-love and, you know, there's this natural, you know, we have to take care of ourselves through lives and, you know, not just be loving to every sociopath and narcissist out there, you know, like we, we have to get through life ourselves, but the more we bring in love for what we do, for who we connect with, the more we give our issues to this higher power, the more we meditate, the more we pray, the more we are in nature, the more we seek balance, then the better life becomes. And, and, you know, the a lot of the lessons are really simple. Remind them to go to nature. So a lot of times we just make things complicated, you know, take a thousand supplements and go to, you know, 14 different um, herbologists and, you know, just eat more apples, you know, just, you know, get more sunlight, you know, I mean, like sometimes answers are rest, meditation, just really simple things that start changing the dial a bit. And, You know, for those who want an awakening, don't give up on meditation, you know, keep going at it. It may not happen right away. It may not happen in a month, may not happen in four months, may not happen in four years, but what do you have to lose? You're definitely going to feel more relaxed because of the practice. You're going to have health benefits and you might open at some point as well. There might be this moment where it all comes together and you don't have to have an accident to have that awakening. You can, you, I'm just, I'm jealous. You can have it through meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess part of the theme that you shared, and I remember listening to your stories about like going back to nature. And I personally, like I wasn't much of a nature person, but after awakening, like I'm doing all this stuff in my garden and growing veggie patch. And for, I've lived at my current place for like 10 years now. For 10 years, I've never had a lawnmower. But after awakening, I have a lawnmower. Like, that's just a typifies like the person I was before. It's like, 
why would you mow your lawn? Opportunity costs as an entrepreneur, like you start paying someone like $35 an hour. What is your hourly rate? And it's all about efficiency. But now it's like, wow, this morning I was talking to one of my friends on the phone and just talking through some stuff and I'm pulling weeds out at the same time. It's like, wow, this is like, this is the <laughs> life. I get to pull weeds. But from, I guess I wanted to tap to see part of the message that you got to like spend more time in nature was there something that they shared with you? Why? What is the beauty of nature? Apart from, oh, yeah, there's nice scenery, there's fresh air and, and all that. But why? Why nature? Well, I think sometimes people who are depressed or suicidal, uh, if they just stay indoors and look at technology and look at a TV, they forget that they're a part of nature themselves. And they need sunlight. And if you just went outside and looked at the stars, your perspective might literally change from I want to die to what is possible. You know, there's just something about merely looking at the stars that shifts your mindset. And I think teenagers, especially this new generation, the Z generation, are so addicted to technology. And there's so much emphasis on, you know, filters and looks and bullying and just like unhealthiness, you know, that's I don't know. I just feel bad for them. I just want to take them all outside and make them look at the stars. And so I do take them outside, you know, except it's not the stars and we go meditate on the grass somewhere and at least introduce them to the practice of meditation because nature is healing. We are part of nature. We need nature. So I've literally felt the ground I've leaned up against a tree. I felt it take some of my pain from my body, you know, that it has literal empathy for me. You know, we've forgotten that nature actually cares about us and we become oriented differently. Our energy becomes different in nature. And, you know, people who, you know, this is kind of a silly side note, um, People who take hallucinogens or, you know, have experiences that way, sometimes they feel as if all of nature loves them. And so we're cutting ourselves off from, you know, the love of the mountains, the love of the sky. It's not just that it's beautiful. It's that we're loved by nature. Yeah. And for the listeners or that you may know listeners that, that like you said, is in the Gen Z um, and it's going through schooling and, and chasing success. One of the research I came across, it says, the students that uh, spend like 30 minutes before an exam in nature, they do better than the people that didn't spend the 30 minutes in nature. Yeah. And, you know, they've also done studies about how dangerous complexes, apartment complexes, when they plant a garden around it and they plant greenery, suddenly crime goes down, that somehow we feel better about the place we live in when we're connected to nature. And then if you're familiar with the medical medium, Uh, literally what you're doing, gardening, putting your hands in the earth has a health benefit. Like it has a literal health benefit, which is amazing. Yeah. Some people say it's even like, actually, I'm not going to say it, but actually I'll say it. They say it's better than yoga, but I don't think it's either or, but yeah, just touching stuff. And I I think the Australian Aboriginal, every time they have an important meeting, they always have it around the trees because they, they believe it will give them wisdom. So Yes, Native people understood this. I heard many shamans speak and they spoke sitting on the ground and it's like the ground supported their wisdom. Uh You know, the earth seemed to give them more power as they spoke. And so one of my goals is to speak on the earth, not to speak in these conferences with a microphone or, you know, to give book sightings, you know, at a bookstore, but to literally just meet people, you know, if I could just uh, do that, then I would be really happy you know, to and, meditate with people in nature. And then you can get all the attendees to practice the spiritual gift of controlling the weather. It's not going to rain. It's not going to be too hot. <laughs> oh yeah. Or you just embrace it. So, you know, I live here in Texas and oh my God, it's been so hot. I recently moved and, you know, I'm just like sweating as I'm moving. And I, I actually love hot yoga, but I've been joking that this has been hot weightlifting. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been uh, fun. So Tricia, for the people that want to connect with you, they feel aligned to what you said, like you've got a book, you've got, do you have course healing sessions, reading sessions? Like what do you have? Yeah, I love doing theta healing with people and I can combine a reading and some healing because a lot of times, 
you know, our loved ones are sending us energy and supporting us on this journey. And then healing is like just part of releasing blocks. So love to do combination calls and just connect with people who resonate. But I also have the spiritual community, which, you know, that's groups of people that meet online and I just love to connect. So I don't have a lot of time to answer emails, but the first month of the spiritual community is free. I still do work full time as a professor. And so I've got to answer all those student emails first. And, you know, that's the priority still. So Professor Trisha, how do people join this um, spiritual community? You know, if you go to my Instagram page, that's probably the easiest, uh, Trisha Barker underscore NDE. And in the link uh, tree, you can find that link. But you can also go to my website, trishabarkernde.com. And maybe I'll put a post up reminding people how to do that on the, the blog. But yeah, I just find me on YouTube, Instagram. Uh, I'll put the website. links on the show notes. Thanks. So thank you. Any parting words you want to share with with our listeners? Well, I think the most important part is that love is all that we take with us. So make sure you do something loving for yourself today or loving for another person. Thank you so much. So grateful to have you on the show. And if you radiate with what you've heard, um, jump onto Trisha's website. Help us share our mission of reaching more awakening souls by liking, commenting, and subscribing to our channel. So thank you and love you guys. Thank you.